Uh, all right, thanks for coming to the talk, uh, Componentizing Application State. If you want to follow along, if, if the, the code is too small or anything, you can scan that code and download the presentation and uh, go to a link that has the demo and all of that. I'll have another link, uh, another QR code and all that at the end too, so you'll be able to grab it. Uh, special thanks to the sponsors of that conference, uh, Cloudflare and Unspecified. And of course, look out for that conference 2024 in um, Wisconsin. I've never been, but I'm excited to, to look into it this year. Uh, ahoy hoy, I'm Nick Nisi, and uh, I'm a software developer in Omaha. Uh, I'm also a panelist on JS Party. You watched me lose on stage maybe last night uh, to this guy, actually, because it, Thunderbird. Thunderbird. <laughs> uh, I'm also the organizer of Nebraska JS and former organizer of NEJSConf and TypescriptConf US. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, I like type TypeScript and JavaScript. I'll put TypeScript first. Uh, React is pretty cool, too. Um, a, qu a few quick notes about this talk. Uh, I use React in this talk. We're not going to look at React too much, so if you're not interested in React, don't worry. All of this applies to any framework, just like XState, and we're going to be talking more about XState and uh, state machines, so uh, I have that. Another thing is uh, I'm using XState 5 in this talk, which came out in November. So a few small things like Storybook XState add-on are not optimized for uh, Storybook 5. Uh, I've worked around them in this talk, and uh, we'll hopefully submit uh, a PR to a X, uh, Storybook XState add-on. But if you go and try this right now with that plugin, uh, with Storybook Five or XState Five, sorry, will not work. So uh, I just wanted to show you the latest stuff because it's more concise terminology, it's better, uh, and I've been looking forward to XState Five for a long time. So I was excited to update. So your application state—it's too complex, but definitely not your application state. Um, when, when I talk about that, I'm talking about like app state versus like the business logic of like how we actually like get that or get to a particular state. Uh, so like I define that as like the app state is like the what conditions, what the app did, uh, what the current conditions of the app are, and the business logic is like how we got that. So that might be just pulling in data, it might be going through some kind of flow and all of that, but those two together create your application state. Uh, and it's, it can be quite complex. There's lots of different things that can contribute to, contribute to that complexity. Uh, many different sources pulling all at once, a lot of concurrency or synchronization issues, um, and temporal dependency. So maybe the time of day or uh, a previous sequence of events that had to occur for uh, a particular state to come about. And if you somehow get into a state without going through the previous other states that it should have gotten into, uh, that could be called like an impossible state. So you sh it should not have been possible for you to get there, but software, sometimes HDMI doesn't even work. So. Uh, it, it can happen. Uh, an example of this would be like a stoplight. Like we want to manage the state for a stoplight, and this is in React, uh, but we have like some React code, and uh, we're just going to switch the state and kind of show you know different levels of what we want to do, and we might use um, like a random value to just say I want to randomly switch to another light. Well, that works totally fine. It's working in this this particular uh, example but it doesn't really make sense for a stoplight, right? It wouldn't make sense to go from green to red and then red to yellow or any combination of that. So we wanna have some kind of flow that protects us to go only into the, the states that we, we can go into based on where we're currently at. So like a, a problem like this would be like, like this is the, the state for that, where we're just randomly, the laser, uh, randomly applying the, the values. Like, that, this is all completely valid and it works, but it's not correct. And so how can we prevent ourselves from doing silly, extremely contrived in this example, um, examples of this? So the solution obviously would just be to, you know, have the business logic set up to correctly go into the state. So we could have the lights in order and then just modulus that to make sure that once we're in the top state, we go back to the bottom state and just go through them in order like that. And that works getting a lot more complex with that. Uh, for stoplights alone, you know, we could add in turn arrows. So we have, you know, at certain points we want to have a left turn or uh, a yellow left turn light. That might change depending on time of day. Maybe this road is one way during, you know, like the, the morning busy hours. Uh, so the lights will always be red going one way and they'll always be green going another or something like that. Same thing with day of the week. Maybe it doesn't happen on weekends. So there's lots of different factors that can contribute to how the business logic should work. And adding all of that together just gets more and more complex. And we set that with more and more variables. So 
setting a light uh, and an arrow and holding the state of both of those, and then individually setting each of those. And you know, we might run into the same problem where we're trying to manage that and we're correctly doing it for the lights, but the arrows, uh, we're randomly doing it again. And we have to repeat that logic over and over and make sure that we handle it. We also have the problem of localized state. So maybe we have like this application logic where you want your, your traffic system to run correctly and have this flow of changing from red to yellow to, uh, or sorry, red to green to yellow uh, and going through that. But then we have like the local state of like, what is this particular light actually showing? And I'm, I'm doing that with a, a simple ternary and some, some awesome tailwind. Uh, drink the tailwind Kool-Aid with me, please. Uh, or at least indulge me in this, this talk. But um, yeah, so we have like this application level state and then we have this like lower level logic that only this component, the thing that is actually showing the lights would care about. Uh, and speaking of components, let's talk about components a little bit. So uh, this is where we'll talk about React just a, a tiny bit, but like I like the, the paradigm of components that you get with React and the other component libraries where you can really consolidate things down. You can consolidate and say, when I create a game, this is what I want. And a game can have you know, all of its styles that make up the game, and then we can have individual players in that game. And a player looks like this. And you can have you know, marquee tags and all of that. That doesn't actually work in React. But um, yeah, you, you like isolate all of that state and uh, how the component should be rendered together in one place. So you have like all of these things, you get uh, an input and uh, locally derived state or some other way of uh, accessing external state potentially like through a, a context or, or other state measures. And then with those two, you get the desired repeated output. And this output can be repeated anywhere. If I have a player over here and a player over here and I pass in different inputs or it's somehow getting different inputs from elsewhere, then it's, uh, it's really getting a lot of, it's always going to, sorry, it's repeatable for those different things. So I can have, um, you know, player A and player B, for example. Um, the, the benefits of that design is that you get uh, a nice isolated state. Everything is internal and self-contained uh, and everything is predictable. So with this input and with the state in this, in this way, we get this output always. Uh, and that's reusable. So we take that same player and we put it over here with a different uh, player value that's passed in, we get a different player, but it's still repeatable uh, and reproducible in a familiar way. And everything is, is modular, so we can um, uh, move it around and manage our system in smaller and smaller pieces that make sense. And of course, it's just fun. Uh, React gives us this declarative UI uh, that's fast, easy, and fun to build with. We also get tools like this, like Storybook, uh, where it just helps us build the components faster because we can focus on the components at the component level uh, and build them in complete isolation outside of the app so that you're not worried about, oh, my, my sidebar doesn't work or it's being influenced by the sidebar in some way. I can make sure that the player works and then the sidebar works, sidebar works and then they work together and I can put them together. Uh, so that really streamlines the development and testing. So an example of using Storybook here is like a player. You know, I can go in and I can individually change the component or the properties that are passed to that and I can see it update in real time as we're going and see that it's, it behaves as we expect. We can do that with, uh, with state as well, as we'll see. Now I tried to, to say on stage last night uh, in the game that Timmy Toady was a, a commonly said thing. Has anyone heard that before? No? Okay. There's more than one way to do it. I learned that from Perl, from my first Perl class in college. Uh, and in Perl, there's definitely more than one way to do things. Um, and j there's more than one way to handle the state. So uh, we can have state across components, have application level state. We can have context in React. Uh, so that's a way of like managing state outside of the component, but easily being able to pass it in without having to like prop drill all the way down. We can use things like Redux and other tools to uh, add a little bit more uh, constraints around how we do it, you know, with different events that we can pass to it and these actions occur when those events happen and, um, and go from there. But what if we could solve our uh, business logic part as well as our state management part together and treat our state just like a component? Well, secretly we kind of already want to. And you, if you've ever seen something like this, anyone ever seen a mirror board that looks like this? Yeah? We kind of want to do this. This is how we want to think about our state as like flows through things and we want to visualize the way that we get from here you know, to here and have a, like a, a repeatable 
way to walk through that, especially with like non-technical stakeholders who, you know, we can show them our, our perfect state management and say, you know, this is how we, we do this, this, and this, and we get to here, and they're like, what? what do we, how do we get to there? But you can walk through something like this and show like, oh, here we're making a decision, which will lead us to here to make another decision, and uh, so on and so forth. And so that's where we can like treat our state like a component. Uh, we can walk through it uh, and verify how the state works without the UI. So we keep the state separate from the UI and manage it as its own thing, which we can visualize and walk through before we even build the UI to make sure that the state behaves and acts uh, exactly how we want to, and then build uh, and go from there. So it becomes, that also allows us to change or think about the way that we develop our components differently because the components can be the, these dumb, uh, and I say dumb as in like they're not managing a lot of their own state, they're only managing the state that matters to them, but they're plugging in and uh, not having a lot of business logic in them because that's all managed by our state and, and they just um, react to it in whatever state it currently is in, which helps us to prevent impossible to get into states from actually occurring. And that's where X state comes in. Uh, we can take our application state and our business logic, marry them together, and uh, have that as one manageable flow. So going back to that stoplight, like a simple state machine for that would look something like this, where we create a machine, and we can say that our, we're initially in the red state, and then we can walk through and say that when we're in the red state and we call switch, it should go to green. And when we're in green and we call switch, it should go to yellow. And yellow should only ever go to red. And so it only goes in that flow. You only have one action that you can actually do to this state machine. Uh, and you can't change that. So we can't go from uh, green to red or red to yellow. It's impossible. So it really helps us to manage our, our flow and our, our flow through the application. And then we can visualize that like this. So we can see that when we're in red, we go to green. These are the events that we call, and they just go around forever, never going into the wrong state. And that's what X state is giving us. <clears throat> so in that way, when we combine that with that visualization, our state becomes like this component that we can manage and we can think about visually, just like we were looking at our components in React visually and seeing, you know, this is properly laid out. We don't like write a bunch of HTML or uh, JSX and say, okay, that looks right. We look at it. We actually render it in a browser and see what it looks like. And that's what we can do with state charts that come from our, our state machines. So we treat that um, just like a component and we can walk through and verify that this transition properly gets us from this event or this, this uh, state to the next state and it's predictable and repeatable and uh, so that we can walk through all of that uh, and we can do that all in uh, Storybook with this Storybook X state add-on. Uh, again, it doesn't work with X state 5, but it will. Uh, and we can also do it with Stately Studio, which is uh, the, the flow I was showing on that previous slide, and I'll show a bunch more of that as well. Um, but that allows us to treat our application state just like a component. So I wanted to talk about how I discovered uh, state machines, and uh, as, as you do, it's on Twitter. Uh, I saw a lot of talk about state machines on Twitter. Uh, I had David on the podcast, uh, JS Party, to talk about it shortly after that. This wonderful screenshot. Uh, from, from that episode. You can't even see cable, which is awesome. Um, but we, we talked about it. I was excited about it. I saw a lot of uh, info on, on Twitter about it and started looking at the XState docs uh, and built a demo app with XState called JS Danger. If you saw the, the game show last night, the, um, that was actually, I found out today, I didn't know this, that one, which is Family, family Feud, uh, is actually written with jQuery, which I was embarrassed by. I didn't write it, but it's uh, written with jQuery. But our Jeopardy style game is written with uh, X state. And so the state, X state manages how we present the game board and what we do when we present a question and how all of the players are handled and how their score is handled and um, how we move between rounds. We're in round one right now, but showing this, showing the answers, all of that is handled uh, through a simple state machine. Simple, uh, this is what it looks like. Kind of zoomed out to show it all, but. There's lots of different states. There's events that we can always do, so we can always change the theme. We have a JS Party theme and a Go time theme for our Go podcast. Um, we have uh, playing audio. At any point, you can play different audio clips, uh, and you can stop the audio immediately. We want to always be able to stop the audio. 
Uh, but then you can go through and like when you're loading, this actually loads the, the JSON file that controls what questions are shown. And then the game itself. So we go in and the game is in an idle mode where it's just showing the board. And then when you go into a question, it goes into here. And these are all of the possible substates of a question that can be had. And it goes from there back into the idle state to show, um, to go back and show the, the question or the game board itself. So all of it is predictable. There's no way for me to show an answer before I show the question. I have to show, or I guess it's Jeopardy. Show the question before I show the answer. Uh, to make it more confusing. <laughs> but uh, it really helps us to prevent any of that impossible state from occurring. So after I built that, I was really excited about it. Uh, I took it to my job and I was like, this seems perfect because I saw this. This is exactly from my job. I've kind of blurred things out to protect the guilty. And, uh, but we were like building out this very complex flow through our application and this is this is all for a single form where you submit three fields and that's it. <laughs> that's what this is. So we like to overcomplicate things quite a bit. Uh, but we were building this in Miro and I was just like, what if we didn't build this in Miro? What if we built the state and then built a state chart from that? And then it, that was always the source of truth. We didn't have to translate this crap, which they didn't even give everyone access to Miro. I had to like go ask somebody for their login. It was, should I say that? I don't even know if I should say that. But like, <laughs> it was just a lot. And so uh, I got the, the go ahead to like do that. I got to take our thing that was made up of several possible flows. This was actually also like a revamp of, of uh, we called it the offer builder. Uh, but we had an existing offer builder. And uh, what it was, was um, we had completely separate code for every flow through there. So we had like four different flows, like if I go back, you know, this was a flow, this was a flow, down here was a flow, and we were adding three more. So we were gonna make it more and more complicated. And what we, our current path, when we, only, when we only had like two or three flows through it was to take that, take the code for that, and it's like all of the form fields, all of the React components, and duplicate it, and just have those in different folders. And then we just use React Router to go to here, or to go to here, or to go to here. But then we wanna make like, we, we've gone through two, um, what's it called, two rebrands. And so for those rebrands, we had to go through every one of those four times, yeah, and just change it here, change it there. Oh, we screwed that up, gotta go change it again, you know, like just a nightmare. And I was like, we're adding more. I don't wanna have to do this and like have all of that. Good on us for not being too dry, but it was the time to, to not repeat ourselves a little bit. So uh, I brought that up and I was like, this looks like a state chart. What if we just took that and we took all of these different flows, all of these different sets of components that we had, and we had one, uh, one source of truth for the components, and then we had a state machine that managed all of that, and it decided what to show when based on what state you were in. And poof, it was just like so much easier to manage and to work with. What it ended up being was a little bit more complicated. It ended up being a single state machine that managed five other state machines uh, that like you can, you can, I'll show some examples of this, but you can have a state machine call another state machine or invoke another one and then go through that flow. And so each individual, one of these pages of the, the form uh, was its own state machine that would manage just the state for that piece of the form. And then it would send messages back up to the parent to build up what it was. Because all we cared about were those three values, but there, it was very complicated to get all of those. And the, the top level state machine didn't care, have to care about all of that. So each individual one would manage that. And, we used Storybook to manage all of that and build it. So I got the go-ahead to spike this and to build out like just a proof of concept. Could we actually do this? And I got a week to do it, went through it. After one week, I had a state machine with state charts rendering in Storybook that I could show. Like, here's that mural board, remember? This is what it looks like in, in XState, and it just works. Like, you go here, and then you can go here and here. And we had all of the business logic done after a week. And then it was just, we, now we have to build the UI to take advantage of that. So much, much simpler. Um, and it would do things like the top level machine would say like, oh, based on the flows that you were at, I can skip that machine and I can skip that machine and go here. So it really kind of like directed what flows were actually happening. Not all state machines would get run in the same flow. It just depended on the, the routes that the user took, the events that the user would pass to the state machine to actually do that. Uh, and it was great, it worked great. I thought it was great. I was like, yes, this is awesome. And uh, 
then I leave the team after you know, we get it all done and uh, other teammates took it over. And I, I just went back in to check on it and you know, ask, how's it going? This is a real message I got. We love you, but X state makes me want to die on a semi-regular cadence. And uh, we talked about that. It was, I was very excited that they uh, brought that feedback to me and, and we talked about it. Uh, and I understood where they were coming from too, because we had done a lot of overcomplicating with five state machines that were managed by a top level state machine. It was a lot. And we kind of didn't do things correctly our first time. Um, some of the things that were wrong, like working on a, a giant JSON object was a little bit wrong. That was probably a little bit my fault because I'm a Vim guy, so like, there's like a whole like Visual Studio Code plugin for like, you know, manually dragging and arranging these things. I don't, I don't know what a text or a visual IDE is, so uh, I didn't use that and I didn't introduce that or like talk about it much. Um, there was a lot of terminology. This was xState4, so there was a lot of different words for the same thing, like actor, interpreter, uh, con versus guard, services, like what's the difference between all of those? And the, like it was pretty dense. Um, and we went overkill in some places. One thing that we had in the previous iteration of it was we had um, a lot of the business logic in React hooks. Well, we were building all of these state machines outside of React, which wasn't able to call like the, the React query hooks to fetch data and do all of those things. So we kind of like made it more difficult on ourselves by like having them callable from hooks or callable from here. And we had like whole flows in the state machine that was just responsible for fetching data and then bringing it back. Um, so it kind of got a little bit overkill. And we tried to do some like things with sharing, like kind of calling React hooks and then sending messages back to the machine. And yeah, we did a lot of things. So uh, it could have been, it, it was a little bit difficult to work with just because of like how we were doing it plus working within React um, and just having a lot of existing business logic in the hooks. Uh, a lot of these things, though, were fixed with xState5. Uh, so terminology being like one of the biggest ones, it's just much easier to talk about and to um, be on the same page with where we're at in those things. So uh, xState5 fixes a lot of those things. And for a long time, I was just like, oh, that's fixed in xState5. That's fixed in xState5. It's finally here. So thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, it, you know, I, I wanted to be honest that there's, it, it can be difficult uh, to get your head around these things, but it, in the end, I think was much more beneficial uh, because it, it's so easy to, to do that. Another thing that we really did, uh, whoops, hang on. Another thing that we did that was kind of problematic uh, was we, um, what was I gonna say? I totally lost my train of thought on that. It'll come to me and I'll tell you. Um, so let's, let's build a state machine. Let's walk through like what actually goes into a state machine and um, and talk about it. So we're gonna build this app. It's a, a meme app that I, I created just for this, where it's going to go to the image flip API, grab all of the possible memes that you can create with that, and then it's going to find out how many captions each of them have, and then give you a prompt so that you can enter in those captions, uh, and then it'll create the meme for you. And so we'll do that with xState. It's a literal meme machine, and this is what it would look like if you just start off. You call create machine from xState, and you just give it a list of states. And if I just do this, where I just give it a list of states, you can see it renders and everything has a little uh, warning sign on it because nothing's connected. Those states don't do anything. We don't have anything set up as an initial state or anything like that. The only thing we've done is set done to type of final, which gives it that little uh, square in it. And that's just, when I get here, the state machine is effectively done and can go away because it, it, does, it won't accept any more inputs. Nothing will change. It's kind of like a promise. It, the promise has resolved when it gets to there. Um, the, the machine itself can handle a context. This is where you would put more of like your infinite state thing. So if you think about like a, a Jeopardy game, I won't have an individual state for every possible question that I have. I'll have an array of questions in there and that can be five questions, 100 questions, however many questions I need for however many rounds I have. And so I'll keep all of that kind of stuff in a context. And this is an interface that defines the context that we'll have. So we'll have a list of memes uh, that we get back from the image flip API. We're gonna select one of those memes, so it'll be null until we get one and select it randomly. And then we'll have a string, of, a string array of captions that we're going to put in and hold on to those as you enter in those. Um, clue and generated meme, uh, Clue we'll, we'll skip for now and we'll come back to. Uh, but the generated meme URL, after we generate the meme, image flip will give us back a URL that we can go to to actually fetch that meme and display it, so we'll have that. And a prompt we'll talk about later as well. So 
the states, the, the finite part of the st finite state machine, these are all of the possible states that the machine can be in. They can't be in any other state, and they can't go from, we can't show us entering captions until we actually have selected a meme, and we can't select a meme until we've loaded all of the memes. We can't do that until we've started the machine. And so it protects us going, uh, going from state to state uh, from accidentally being in some kind of impossible state. Again, the done is just the final state, just the end. And we've now defined initial, and we set that to initial. I'm very creative. But as soon as the state machine starts, it's going to immediately go into the initial state, and that's where things will kick off from there. The events, this is how we get from state to state. We can pass events to the machine, and we just do that using the send, uh, the send method. And I'll show some examples of that, but this allows us to say that when we're in the state, we can send an event, and if the, the state that we're in is a, uh, set up to accept that event, it will react to that. If we send it an event that it's not set up for, it's not gonna do anything. It'll just completely ignore it because we haven't told it what to do with that, so it protects us from accidentally doing anything that we shouldn't want to do. Or, yeah? Is it possible, is there an automated way to capture and log those behind the scenes for follow-up? Um, that's a good question. You you could uh, yeah you could have a like have it set up on the state itself, uh, and David, do those bubble up? Like uh, yeah. If I had a, like uh, do, or if I had next set up on one state and then I had it set up on the whole machine itself, would both of those get called? So it checks the lowest state first. Yeah. The, the deepest state. Okay. But it. it but once it finds one, it doesn't go up from there. Okay, it's good to have the creator in the audience. <laughs> so it sounds like even if you do it manually, you could just put that at the top level handler. Yeah. Because nothing lower is actually required. Right. Okay, like an exception, got it. Yep, you could have it like have some event handler and then have that re-send something that the machine listens to at, at that state. But yeah, it'd be a little bit more manual. <clears throat> so speaking of those events, we can define exactly what those events are that we can pass to it. And we can do that in a type safe way where we say like we only accept these events and when we accept like an ad caption or an ad prompt for example, we also are going to provide it a value. Otherwise the other ones they only provide a start, uh, sorry, a type and that's start, next, enter prompt, enter captions or retry. Those are all of the possible states that we can pass to it. And so when we're actually like calling the send method from TypeScript because we're all using TypeScript, uh, we, we always, right, yeah. Uh, you know, we'll get uh, an error if we try and send anything but those. So that's great. Uh, start and next, they just move us to the next state whenever they're defined. Add caption will uh, provide a way for us to add a caption that we're going to take from the text field. This is the value that we entered into the text field. We're going to send that to the machine and it's going to store it. Same thing with add prompt. We'll talk about that one uh, a little later. Same thing with uh, enter captions or enter prompt. These allow us to kind of branch. We'll kind of show some branching through the state machine to do different things. Uh, and then retry, like if we want to re, if we didn't like the meme that was selected, we can retry and fetch a different meme uh, and go from there. So how are we going to transition from, load, from initial to load memes? We're just going to call next. So we'll just define this with on and then say next. Whenever we receive a next event, the target, whenever we pass a string, we're just identifying the next target to go to, and that's load memes, which is right here. So it's just going to go there once we send that event. And this, the state chart gets redrawn to show an arrow between those. And so it says, you know, when we hit next, go to load memes. The rest of them are still in warning state because there's no possible way to get to them yet. Now we can invoke machines from other machines, which is what we're going to do with the fetch memes uh, state. In here, uh, I'm tagging it with loading. I'll use that within React. I can check to see if the current state has a tag of loading, and I'll show a little loading indicator. That's the only thing. That way I don't have to define that as different states. Um, that's what I'm doing here. Loading is not anything special. It's just the tag that I decided for this that I'm using within this, app, uh, within this state machine. But then I'm going to call invoke. So when we enter this, this state, we're going to invoke a source here, which is called fetch memes. Uh, and on done, we'll tell it to go to the select meme state. So now we have this on done. Uh, right there that will go down to select meme uh, and an action. So the event that was passed when we call, uh, when the on done is called, it will give us an output, which is what we, what the memes were that were fetched from it. 
and we can assign that to the memes array, and that's what this assign is doing here. So what's actually happening within the fetch memes? Well, we have an actors object down at the bottom of our state machine in here, and we have this thing called uh, fetch memes, and xState provides this from promise, uh, which is just a wrapper around an asynchronous function or a promise that allows us to take that promise and uh, treat it as if it were a state machine, which is exactly what a promise is. A promise, you immediately enter into a pending state, and then it either immediately or eventually accepts or rejects, and it never changes from there. Those are both final states. So that's what a promise um, state machine would look like. And this is what the, um, the async function looks like for fetch memes that it's calling right here. We're just doing a fetch, to get the, the get memes API call, getting back the JSON data, and then setting the memes from that response, uh, returning that, and that's what we're, we're getting uh, assigned to fetch memes here. Now, reminder, we're going through this. We've now fetched memes from the image flip API, uh, and we could do things with them. We could have a UI to display them, but we haven't actually created any UI yet. We're proving out, and we're visually seeing that we're going through our application and things are going in the order that we expect, and we're doing things as we expect them to, but we haven't actually created any UI yet. So we're able to test up to this point and see, yeah, things are working as I expected, but we don't have any UI yet. That can come later once we, once we want to plug it in. And we can uh, visualize all of that with either Stately Studio or uh, Storybook. And this is what it would look like as we're going through. And we can even enter into a simulation mode where we're in initial, and then we hit start, we go to load memes, and we can simulate when done happens, now we're going into select memes. And that's all the further we've gotten so far, but it's a good visualization, a good way to check, yep, my state is happening exactly as I suspect, that, uh, or as, as I expect it to, and uh, we, we don't have to test anything else because it can't enter, we can't go to select meme before we've loaded memes. So, success. So in select meme, uh, we're going to select a random meme. And so once we enter this, we have an entry call. Entry just means as soon as I enter this state, run this. And so we're going to call assign and immediately select a meme. And then always means as soon as I enter this, always do this other thing, which is just enter captions. So this is like a transitional state where we're not actually like ever, we're never going to spend more than just you know, one cycle in this state where it's assigning the meme and then immediately moving us into the enter captions state. Now, once we're in intercaptions, we can have substates within there. This is like a state machine inside of a state machine. We could define this as a separate state machine or just internally have that. And this allows us to have parallel or sequential states uh, within our state machine so that we can handle, handle like a flow in here and then call, go into a final state, uh, which we'll call on done, which will advance us in the top level state uh, to the next one. And so in here, we're just saying intercaptions, we have our own states defined in here. Uh, and an initial state, so we'll go into the entering state, and then entering will immediately, I'll show it here, uh, entering is just using a type guard. A guard is like a conditional statement that's always going to get checked, and if it matches, it's going to do whatever the action was. So in this case, we're gonna call a guard called needs more captions. So we're gonna check, like we know what the meme, the random meme is that we have selected now, we know that it needs two captions. So do we, have we selected two captions yet? Is our captions array of length two yet? If it's not, then that's what we're checking here. We're just checking the box count from the selected meme. If that's greater than the length of the captions that we have, then return true because we need more captions. So when we need more captions, uh, we'll go to the needs more captions state. So that's what will get triggered immediately. If we had all of our captions, then we'll just go to this other one, which is done. So we can do that check every time uh, and see where we need to go. So we'll enter those captions. On the enter caption one, we'll just stop here and wait for the user to send us an event called add caption. And that is going to have an event on it that'll have a value. And we can set that value. I'm defaulting it to default here. But we'll just set that using the assign to the captions array, which we'll take from the context and we'll uh, just concat onto it to give us back a new array that contains both of them. And then we'll tell it to go back to entering. So after we've added a caption, go back to entering so that it immediately checks again. Do I, have, do I need more captions? OK, it'll come back to enter captions. Otherwise, it'll go to done. Does that make sense? Cool. So this is what it looks like so far. Again, no, no React code yet. Uh, but look at my component. It's, it's coming together. We can see everything is set up exactly as we would like it to be. Uh, this is Stately Studio, uh, stately.ai, uh, and it's taking my state machine and rendering it 
here. And I'll kind of show some examples of that, but you can, you can design them in Stately Studio yourself, uh, or you can set up, uh, there's a Stately inspector that you can set up in your app so that it can like, connect to that and immediately send your real application state over to it so you can visualize it as you're going through. We'll see some examples of that here in a sec. So now that we've got the captions, we've got a random meme, uh, we can go and generate that meme. So uh, we'll invoke that actor, and generate meme is just like the fetch memes one. It's going to send a message. We're going to call um, the generate meme uh, service, which is going to use a from promise again to go fetch, uh, to go post to the image flip API with our selected meme and our captions. Going to send both of those, and then on done, it's going to assign our generated meme URL because we'll get a URL back from that. We'll assign that back into the state, which will allow us to go to our done state, and our done state will allow us to see the actual app. So we'll do this, we ra randomly selected it, we'll put in something, that conference, and we need another one, Texas, 2023 slash four. So that's the loading indicator and a random meme that was generated from it. And it went really fast, but it's highlighted now on done because that's the state that we're in. So this is the, the stately inspector rendered to the right of the application that's running uh, in an iframe so that we can see them together and we can walk through them and see, as I make this change in the UI, this is where I'm at in my state. And that really helps me to visually debug what might be going wrong uh, with, our, with our state. Any questions so far? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Those are all set up. And if you were to, if you were to be in Stately Studio and, and be dragging and dropping all of this, it's auto-generating all of that for you. Um, I did it kind of manually here, and that's, I'm a Vimmer again. That's how I roll. I, I got to visually, or I got to be in the text and do it. But uh, I really like being able to visualize that. Do you have a question? Um, do you, does this lessen the need for things like unit tests? Because it's visual, you're knowing it's working, you don't have impossible state. Yep. So like you don't even care to unit test some of this? Or some of that. Or still a demand sometimes? Yeah, you would want to test, I mean there's still some things that you're always going to want to test, but like the, the flow through your application, you can be assured that, like you can just trust, assume that X state is doing its job properly and it's never going to, you know, if I send it a, uh, a foo event, but I don't have foo defined, it's not going to go do anything crazy. It's just going to ignore that. So it, it really helps you to not worry about that and focus just where your specific biz business logic is and let like the flow through your application be handled by X state. <clears throat> so we got all that set up. Now let's just briefly take a look at how we use X state from React. Uh, again, Timmy Toady, there's more than one way to do this, but the way that I did it in this app uh, is I'm using a, from XState React, there's a create actor context that I can do that will allow me to create a context and a provider in React. And then from there, I can get the machine provider and export that. And then I can export two custom hooks, uh, use actor ref and use selector. And then that's how I can actually use it from within my React applications. So the use actor ref will give me uh, a reference to the actual actor, the, the uh, instantiated uh, state machine that I have uh, so that I can do anything with it. And then I also have a send event. And this is how I will actually send those events to the machine to get it to do things. So like for example, uh, I'll call send and I can say add caption and then I can say that conference is awesome. That's the value uh, for the caption that I'm gonna send and I'll send it up to the machine. Yeah. And is that type saved as well? Yep. So like, okay. Yeah, it'll complain if add caption isn't a defined type. As long as you set that up within your state machine. And then use selector, uh, that will return a snapshot of the, current, uh, of the current actor via a callback so that then you can query that snapshot uh, and get data back and return that. And uh, this is nice because it won't cause a re-render if the selected value hasn't changed at all. So it'll only cause your, your React code to, to re-render um, re if the value has actually changed. Uh, so yeah. In here, I'm doing a, a use selector to get the selected meme, so I just get it off of the context and return it here. Same thing with the captions, I'm just getting it off of the context. But I can also 
uh, query different things. So in the code, uh, I'll have a link at the end that you can go download the code and, and look at it on GitHub. Um, I'm doing a thing where if you're not in a state that can add a caption, I don't want to show an add caption button or the text field. And so I can do things like check the snapshot. Can it accept an add caption in the current state that it's in? This will return true or false, and then I can decide in my React code whether I should show something or not. So let's add a new state. We went through and we were able to create a caption. Let's actually go and add a new state. Uh, I'm going to use OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT's API in here. Uh, LLMs are unpredictable. These are the safeguards that I put in. I'm going to run a live example uh, on this. I don't want it to curse or offend anyone, and it's d been pretty good about that. I just, in case it does in a live, like, in case this is the time, you know, uh, this is what I put in. So <laughs> forgive me if it happens. Uh, this was randomly generated from it, too. Um, yeah. But I have that sent with every message that I send to OpenAI in this demo. <laughs> so let's generate a meme clue. We can add in a new state. We can just go to our, our um, states uh, object, and we can add in a new one called get clue. And it'll be a loading one because we're going to invoke a get clue, which will be another from promise call that's just going to call the OpenAI API, and uh, we're going to pass data to it. And so we'll pass in this input. We're going to pass in from our context just the selected meme that we have. And from there, it'll take things off of the selected meme, like um, the name of the meme specifically, and uh, I think that's all it's going to do in this one, just the name of the meme and send it up to OpenAI, and then it'll show a clue. It'll go to the show clue there. So then here's the, the React code for that. If our state is in show clue, then I just want to render this. So in here, I can say, here's your clue, show the clue, and a button um, to go in to the next, to the add caption. So then we can see a clue because in that example, it was like, here, enter two prompts. We have no idea what you're, you're actually memeing, right? You just are entering prompts, and maybe it makes sense for the meme that you got randomly selected. But let's show them a clue. OpenAI is going to generate us either a haiku or a limerick based on the name of the meme, and then display that so that we can um, do that. So let me show a live example of that. I'll go over to XState meme, and here it is with uh, the state machine rendered on the right. And so, oh, my. <laughs> My, uh, uh, resolution. my resolution has changed, yes, thank you. Uh, so this is what it looks like, you know, if I just said that conference is awesome. It'll generate that. Whew. And you can kind of read that, but it put them together. Awesome? It is awesome. Um, so that's that one. Uh, but when we add in a clue to it, now I'll also say that uh, I've run into some timing issues with stately with the X state inspector, uh, to where sometimes it doesn't actually do it, and I have to refresh a couple of times uh, for it to. There, I'll do that. But if it doesn't uh, do it, I didn't have time to debug why exactly, but I'm sure this will get fixed. <laughs> okay, uh, pretend that it's rendering that state machine. Um, so it's going to go, and it's immediately getting the clue. In lands far, with doubts so wild, a young skeptic, no, more ch no mere child, his furrowed brow's fame gained mematic acclaim, questions like one exiled. Questioning like one exiled. Anyone have any idea what meme that is? I, I, no idea. So whatever, we'll go and add captions. We'll, I'll just say that conference is in Texas. I don't know. OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you can have fun with this, because you, you, like, even if you get a clue, you have no idea what it's actually calling. And so it, it, it can just be a lot of fun. Um, but we'll go look at that machine real quick, just to kind of see what it looks like. So the whole machine is set up. Let me make this bigger. The whole machine is set up. Um, this is how I'm defining the types. I've defined the, you know, a meme machine context as an interface and then a type for the events. And I'm just setting an empty object and I'm casting it to have context and events so that it's automatically set up. Now it knows what can be stored in the context and what can be, what can be sent as events. Then I've got, uh, I'm just naming my machine meme machine uh, and I'm setting my context to a default set of values. So memes will always be an array for me. 
Uh, selected meme will be null to start. Same thing, captions will be an array. And then my clue and generated meme URLs will be null until I start. We have our initial state and we go into the initial one. Load our memes. Select meme. Here's the show clue. Um, where is the get clue? Did I pass that? Get clue. Oh, get clue, right there. So yeah, it just gets the clue, just like what I showed. And then it shows the clue. And once you, you're done, then it goes straight to enter caption. So I was able to inject this into the state machine just by changing like the targets on the previous and the, uh, the previous state to tell it to go to the get clue first and then get clue continue this on our way from there. <clears throat> All right, so let's, uh, let's is it still too hard to generate a meme? Let's, let's add another state to it. Uh, and in this one, we can generate or enter a prompt. So now instead of just blindly you know, accepting and getting a clue but still not knowing what it is, we can just have, enter a prompt and then have it generate a, uh, a meme for us. So we'll just kind of do the same thing. We'll have like a, another loop in there where we can kind of go in to generate captions. Uh, and if we uh, like have it accept one caption and then generate that and then continue on uh, to its final state. And so, um, oops, 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 oops. Yeah, here we go. I'll refresh it a couple times to see if it'll actually render. I swear it was like rendering fine. That's why I'm using Safari too, because it was like working in Safari and now I'm, I broke something, but I will fix it. So we generate the clue, a wrestler turns star in the car, his eyes glare hard, meme with shock and awe. This is the rock looking behind his shoulder. Uh, I forgot the name of the movie, but uh, so we have that one. We can either, Space Mountain, yeah. We can either retry, which uh, I added in as another state where it'll just go back to the select meme. And that's all I had to do. Like you send that and it just goes back and like we added a retry state, a re, like a re-entry through the application without having to do anything, which is awesome. Uh, we just added one button to the UI and that's it. Uh, so then now we can either add captions or we can enter a prompt. So I've been messing with like, um, you know, a successful demo at that conference. I've learned that I have to put that conference in quotes, otherwise it's generic conference. Um, that the audience loved. Right, right? Yeah. <laughs> so well, have it do that. It's going to generate the, the meme. So when you nail the presentation, but the crowd's reaction is bigger than your expectation, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> but this is a lot of fun, so I'm going to do one more. I've been doing this, like, a lot because it's been too fun. Two web slingers pause. All right, this is the spider van. <laughs> Mirrored heroes in surprise, fingers aimed with cause. So someone give me a prompt. Not all at once. <laughs> if you want to hire me for design work, I'm available. All right. When you and your friend both show up to the party in the same outfit, when you realize you both brought the same generic snack to the potluck, that makes no sense with the prompt, but oh, open AI. Okay. This, that tracks the chat GPT. <laughs> All right, so um, kind of to wrap up, uh, treating your application state like a component is a great way to keep your, your business logic separate from your application, like UI level logic, uh, and to keep it properly synced with your business logic so that things happen as you expect them to. You get to visualize the business logic with your team, especially with uh, non-technical members. Like if you have you know, product managers, uh, you can show them, walk through the code as the state chart that's rendered from the actual code and verify, you know, this is the flow that we discussed. Uh, these are the changes that we're gonna make. But you don't have any UI yet. So you can have all of that nailed down before you actually go build the UI, which is great. Uh, you can visualize all of that with Storybook, with the Storybook XState add-on uh, and with Stately Studio, uh, which is probably a, a better way to go right now. Um, and that QR code uh, and or this link right here will take you to a site that 
has the slides, has the demo, has uh, links to the machines in Stately Studio, so you can go walk through uh, all of those and um, run it yourself. It also has links to the GitHub, so you can run the, the meme generator. You just have to provide your own OpenAI keys because uh, I, it's addictive. <laughs> uh, so thanks. This was uh, one of them that was created from that. Oh, that's great. <laughs>